Hello, Blockheads. This is Paul Boyer. This episode, I'm going to talk about strength in numbers. There's an ATM machine that gives out unlimited free money. There, there's the exploding hash rate. And we'll hear what Satoshi had to say about the rising difficulty of Bitcoin hashing. I'll have a guru, I'll have a tool, and more, all here on Season 2, Episode 11 of The Mad Money Machine. Broadcasting from the Bitcoin bunker, six blocks below. Brandishing the blockchain to fight good versus evil. This is Bitcoin versus the man. This is the battle of the century. This is the Mad Money Machine. Well, my, my, the summer is winding down, the days are slowly getting shorter, and season two is growing long in the tooth. I'm so happy to be sponsored by Brocker.com, B-R-A-W-K-E-R.com. Before you buy it, Brocker it! I want to start with this story. Australian man exploits ATM glitch to create a half a million dollars. Meet Dan Saunders, the Australian man who managed to trick his ATM into creating a half a million dollars out of thin air. I'm picking it up from a website dcmagnates.com by Leon Pick, who summarized the story from Australian and New Zealand media. He quotes the Sydney Morning Herald's subheadline, which reads, Three years after Dan Saunders admitted he stole thousands thanks to, an, thanks to an ATM error, he's still waiting to be arrested. And a New Zealand website writes how he stole 500k and got away with it. Quoting the story from DC Magnates, I'll have a link to this and the Sydney Morning Herald article if you want more details, but... Uh, It says, in short, Saunders had been working as a barman making $700 a week. And here, of course, it's Australian dollars, which are essentially the same. They fluctuate around parity with the United States dollar. So it's about the same as 700 US dollars. While drinking one night and in need for more cash, he stumbled upon a glitch in his National Australia Bank ATM. Initially, he was able to withdraw up to his daily limit even in the absence of sufficient funds, by tricking the system into making transfers between his credit card and savings accounts without initially recording a debit at the other end. Banks allow for the transfer of funds between accounts when an ATM is offline so as not to inconvenience customers. The next day, however, balance was restored with the negative amounts updated. To deal with this, Saunders found that if he did this every night and transferred more than he spent that day, the computer system will never catch on thinking he has money in his account. Now, eventually he got to the point where uh, he wanted to kind of pay back the uh, money that he'd tricked the ATM out of. So he tried betting to win it back. And of course, he lost. Eventually, he racked up a $20,000 debit in his savings account. In a panic, he transferred $60,000 from his MasterCard into it, but now the machine wouldn't let him withdraw cash, likely due to the recent history. Presented with five options then, savings, checking, MasterCard, Visa, and, quote, credit card, he selected credit card as the source of the transfer. Surprisingly, the mystery source worked, despite the system saying canceled. He was essentially able to withdraw unlimited amounts from a non-existent credit card to his other accounts. Saunders says, It occurred to me that this was not real money, but simply numbers flying back and forth. Basically, the bank systems thought there was money in my accounts when there wasn't. All I had to do was transfer enough funds to cover the funds spent, and as if by magic, the accounts were replenished or freshened each day. Though taught from a young age that stealing is wrong and having kept clean his entire life, one thing led to another, another. and eventually he lived a life of private jets, limos, escorts, luxury hotels, and gambling. He says he could have gone past the 
500k and the bank still wouldn't have noticed. Expecting to be arrested any day, he is still waiting. The DCMagnates.com website says, What does this have to do with virtual currency? It was noted on today's Reddit how millions in counterfeit $100 bills eluded federal investigators for years. The, qualities, uh, the quality of these bills was impeccable. Bitcoin does not allow for counterfeiting. We see that despite best efforts, one of traditional fiat's disadvantages is its susceptibility to occasional creation out of thin air. Well, if you want to read the article that sounds more like a novel than just a factual presentation, I've got a link in the show notes uh, to the uh, original newspaper article. It goes on for quite a while. And it reads like a great plot line for a movie. I just wonder why he doesn't end up like Julian Assange or Edward Snowden. All right, so I'm continuing to um, innovate, improvise, change things around on how the magic word works. You'll just have to listen to the whole show, I suppose, to see how the magic word's going to work this week. I know some people who are getting used to finding the magic words in the other podcasts so easily are probably upset with this show. In fact, you know, I've tested it out. I, I was able to go into one of the uh, Let's Talk Bitcoin shows. I basically scanned to exactly the right spot instantly of where he mentioned the magic word. And so it's quite easily uh, uh, cheated or gamed, I guess. You don't have to listen to the whole show to get their magic words. On the Mad Money Machine, unfortunately for you, you do. Here's something else that happened in the past couple of weeks. We uh, reached a milestone in the Bitcoin hash rate. Now, when I started the Mad Money Machine Bitcoin show back in December of last year, the hash rate was something around 6 million giga hashes per second. Um, the 100 million giga hash per second mark was uh, reached last June, this past June. So we went from 6 million to 100 million. And then between June and now, two months, we we've crossed the 200 million giga hashes per second mark in uh, the Bitcoin hash rate. It looks like it's doubling about every two months. And of course, that's an exponential curve. I think there's a saying, probably more wittily phrased than what I remember, but it goes something like this. If something can't continue forever, then it won't. And uh, I've got to believe that this exponential increase in the hash rate won't continue forever. Let's go see what origami he's folding up this week in Satoshi's Corner. Well, we just talked about the hash rate in Bitcoin, the current hash rate, and how it's going crazy. Satoshi was also interested in this um, increase in the uh, difficulty of finding the correct hash. Uh, for those of you that aren't uh, is technically inclined, let me just give a brief summary of what's going on here. Uh, the Bitcoin uses a proof of work to validate blocks. And so everyone out there is competing uh, to accumulate transactions put them into a block, hash the block, which is a one-way computational function that creates a number, a big, 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 big number. And for the same data, every time you hash it, you create the same number. But if you change the data slightly, it creates a radically different number, big, 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 big number. Well, the target hash that we need to find has a l number of leading zeros. So if you imagine this big, big number where the first uh, set of numbers in this large number are all zero, that's our target hash. And uh, the difficulty comes about in how many leading zeros we need to find. If you, if you don't have many leading zeros, then it's probably pretty easy to find a hash that is less than the target value. Well, Satoshi was talking about this 
in the BitcoinTalk.org forums. Back in February 5th, 2010, and in a posting entitled, Proof of Work Difficulty Increasing, <laughs> he says, We had our first automatic adjustment of the proof of work difficulty on 30 December 2009. This is just um, one little over one month prior to his uh, writing this posting. He says the minimum difficulty is 32 zero bits. So even if only one person was running a node, the difficulty doesn't get any easier than that. For most of the last year, we've been hovering below the minimum. On 30 December, we broke above it and the algorithm adjusted to more difficulty. It's been getting more difficult at each adjustment since then. The adjustment on 4 February took it up from 1.34 times last year's difficulty to 1.82 times more difficult than last year. That means you can generate only 55% as many coins for the same amount of work. The difficulty adjusts proportionally to the total effort across the network. If the number of nodes doubles, the difficulty will also double, returning the total guarantee, uh, the total generated to the target rate. Uh, for those technically inclined, he says, the proof of work difficulty can be seen by searching on target colon in debug.log. It's a 256-bit unsigned hex number, which the SHA-256 value has to be less than to successfully generate a block. It gets adjusted every 2016 blocks, typically two weeks. That's when it prints, quote, get next work required retarget in debug.log. And here he created a table, which he continued to update for quite a, quite a while throughout the year 2010 of the difficulty uh, of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network. He says in 2009, the difficulty was basically one. That's the, that's the target difficulty that was initially set. It's the minimum difficulty. And then uh, by the end of 2009, December 30th, 2009, the difficulty was 1.8, 18% more than it had been. Then, uh, just 11 days later, it was 1.31. Uh, 14 days later, it was 1.34. And then he, got, he has this table of sh this difficulty going up, 1.82, 2.53, 3.78, 4.53, 11.5, Four point five three up and up and up throughout the year every couple of weeks until we get to August of 2010 August 26th of 2010 this difficulty reached 623 all in that one year and this is almost exactly four years ago that uh, we're, we're looking at this difficulty of the Bitcoin uh, hash well what is it today four years later it was 623 on August 28th, 2010. Today, the difficulty is 23.8 billion. <laughs> one of the one of the follow-up postings postings to uh, Satoshi's uh, posting there was by a member called Suggester, and he says in there, Satoshi, I figured it will take my modern Core 2 Duo about 20 hours of non-stop work to create 50 Bitcoins. With older PCs, it will take forever. People like to feel that they own something as soon as possible. Is there a way to make the generation more divisible? So say, instead of making 50 Bitcoin every 20 hours, make 5 Bitcoin every 2 hours. I don't know if that means reducing the block size or reducing the 120 block threshold to say 12 blocks only or what, but because the difficulty is increasing, I can imagine that a year from now, the situation will be even worse. Three plus weeks until you see the first spendable coins. And we find a better, and we find a better solution for this ASAP. And Satoshi did reply the next day. He said, I thought about that, but there wasn't a practical way to do smaller increments. The frequency of block generation is balanced between confirming transaction as fast as possible and the latency of the network. The algorithm aims for an average of six blocks per hour. If it was five Bitcoin and 60 per hour, there would be 10 times as many blocks and the initial block download would take 10 times as long. It wouldn't work anyway because that would be only one minute average between blocks too close to the broadcast latency when the network gets larger. 
And the posting continues back and forth with Suggester, and Satoshi answers a couple more questions in that thread. One of the last postings, actually somebody put in this year, February 6, 2014, Nightcoin says, this should go in the history textbooks. <laughs> and Sonny says, the good old days. Well, thank you, Satoshi Nakamoto. So why did the Bitcoin price take such a dive? I think on the last episode of the Mad Money Machine, the price was around $600 a Bitcoin. Prior to that, it had been relatively stable throughout um, the mid part of the year. And then in uh, mid-August, it really took a nosedive down from 600 down 550 500 450 briefly going lower than that at times on various exchanges. You know, Bitcoin has such a thinly traded market. There's any number of reasons why the price could go down. But here's one I want you to think about. What if there's one person who holds a lot of Bitcoin that really wants to sell a lot of Bitcoin? What does that one person do if they want to sell it quickly? And what happens to the price if they have a lot of Bitcoin that they want to sell quickly? Well, they keep lowering the uh, asking price for their Bitcoin because they want people to come in and buy it. So they start out, you know, asking $600 for it. All the people that offer $600 uh, are, you know, worked out of the market. And then the price drops down to $575. And then finally, the people that are willing to offer $575 buy up some of the Bitcoin. And then all of those people are gone. The price drops down to the point where people that are offering $550 for a Bitcoin, uh, they get their orders filled. On and on, this seller's supp supply seems inexhaustible for a while. The price keeps going down and down. $550, $525, $500, $475, $450, $425. $4 the seller is motivated to sell. He's got a short time horizon for whatever reason. You know, he can't wait for f more buyers to come into the market to get that higher price. He wants to sell now. And so that's one way the market works. It's not the only way the market works. You know, the other thing is August, people are on vacation in August. Maybe the people that are motivated to buy Bitcoin just aren't really in the market right now. And so anybody who needs to sell in August has to suffer the lower prices of those who are still around wanting to buy Bitcoin. A little bit about market dynamics and why Bitcoin prices fluctuate. You're listening to Paul Boyer's Mad Money Machine. I'd like to turn now to our sponsor segment. Mad Money Machine is proud to be sponsored by Brawker.com. B-R-A-W-K-E-R.com. Before you buy it, Brawker it. You know, one of the exciting things that I have seen watching Brocker grow up is when I first started talking about it, there, the transactions on there were kind of few and far between. Not many people had really uh, taken notice of Brocker. But I'd like to think through um, sponsoring the Mad Money Machine and having listeners like you go out and try Brocker.com, that there are quite a number more people now using the system. And how do I know? Well, you can actually go into Brocker.com and click on the Buy Bitcoins tab and see some completed orders. And you can see some orders that are yet to be completed. For example, this order from Swiss Watcher, S-W-I-S-S-W-A-T-C-H-E-R, who wants to buy two $50 gift cards from Co-op at Home. So it doesn't have to be Amazon or iTunes or eBay. It doesn't have to be one of the mega retailers that you use Brocker for. No, just about any merchant online where you can pay with a credit card or PayPal is now turned into a place where you can use Bitcoin to buy that merchandise. Create an account at Brocker, load it up with some Bitcoins, say spend Bitcoins, create your order, and when it's fulfilled, send the Bitcoin amount 
to your buyer. Everybody wins with Broker.com. They get the Bitcoins and you get the items. So before you buy it, Broker it. Let's pull something out of the Mad Money Machine Bitcoin Tool Crib. Well, this is an oldie but a goodie, and it's back from the dead. So do you remember last April when um, Apple banned Bitcoin wallets from its iTunes and App Store? Yeah, you remember that. That's when people were smashing their iPhones in protest of Apple's decision to exclude Bitcoin wallets. Well, they recently lifted that ban. And let's hear what Nick Carey of Blockchain.info had to say about it on CNBC. Bitcoin wallet firm Blockchain has crossed the 2 million user mark despite the company's app being barred from the Apple Store for the last six months. The tech titan allowed the firm to return to its iOS platform a couple of weeks ago. Nick Carey joins us, the CEO of Blockchain. Nick, good morning to you and welcome. Thank you very much. Well, to what extent do you think that's held back? blockchain, um, this position that Apple took? So six months ago, Apple let us know that they were going to be removing our wallet app from their store. And this was a big deal for Bitcoin users because hundreds of millions of people were not going to have access to learn about this interesting technology. So we were a little disappointed, but we immediately started working on Android. And uh, this year, we've seen hundreds of millions of dollars in venture capital pour into Bitcoin related startups. And all of that money was directed toward Apple or uh, Android related development. Mm -hmm. So Apple sort of witnessed this. And uh, for Four weeks ago, we launched a brand new Android wallet to a lot of fanfare. We natively integrated a merchant map so people can discover Bitcoin services in restaurants and cafes anywhere in the world they go. Apple witnessed this, and in cooperation with them, we quickly launched a new iOS wallet. So this is a huge deal. It's pivotal for Bitcoin and really important for blockchain. And security remains, I guess, a key concern because there's been so many headlines about people having their Bitcoin stolen. Um, how comfortable can they feel that the current technology that you're putting out there is uncrackable? So uh, blockchain open sources all of its technology, and I think this was a key piece of knowledge for Apple to understand. Uh, they extended an olive branch to us to build an app for them, and despite the fact that we were out of the store over the last six months, we've actually grown from one million users at the beginning of this year to hitting the two million user mark just a couple of days ago. This is huge for us because despite Apple's position, we were still able to grow, but now we're even more excited than ever because millions of users around the planet will have access to a free wallet service that they can install instantly on their phone and start to use the Bitcoin network. As you, as you profile your users, who is it that's seeking you out? So Bitcoin solves a lot of interesting problems. Um, for one, there are many people around the planet that don't have access to financial services whatsoever. So we're seeing really strong growth in emerging and frontier markets, which shouldn't be a huge surprise. So for example, countries like Argentina and Brazil, um, Morocco, we've seen strong growth in Eastern Europe as well. So this week's tool is blockchain for iPhone and Android. I recommend that you get it. I recommend you get a blockchain.info account. I recommend you implement two-factor authentication. And I recommend you use a PIN number for your blockchain app on your mobile device. Blockchain. Like the best things in life, it's free. Uh, well, here's somebody else that was on CNBC, Winces Cesaris of Zappo, X-A-P-O, got on there and talked about the future looks bright for Bitcoin. Advocates of Bitcoin say this is one of the main potential uses for Bitcoin. Yeah, we see most of the users um, come from the emerging world and mostly because of problems they have either with the local currencies or with the local banks. Walk us through your, your interest, your investment. What does it look like right now? I think um, the Bitcoin right now looks like TCP IP um, or like the internet before there was a browser. It's very early, but if you look uh, under the hood, you can see that it's something that can change the world. We see um, people in the developed world are investing a little bit of their assets, usually less than 1% of their savings into Bitcoin in a very speculative manner, if you will. But in the developing world, where most of the users are coming from, they're doing so because they have no alternative to safe keep the fruits of their labor. 
the comparison to the internet is one that makes people say, okay, maybe Bitcoin is still a decade or so away from being harnessed correctly, regulated in the right way. And just this week, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau here in this country started accepting customer complaints over Bitcoin and people who had lost a lot of money felt like there wasn't enough disclosure. I'm wondering where you see Bitcoin on the trajectory of being legitimized. I think, again, it's very early on. Um, I think that the, um, the guidelines that the CFPB issued are spot on in regards to the risk prices, hack, hacking, um, the, um, the scam uh, risks and, and others because it's, because it's very early on. But at the same time, we're beginning to see the emergence of an industry that is, um, that is providing very professional services on top of Bitcoin, that is having venture capital backing. And so again, it looks a lot like the beginning of the internet when we were just beginning to see the browser and, and the basic infrastructure, but it's developing quickly, more quickly than most people uh, imagine or expect. It's all about the numbers, the growing numbers of people using Bitcoin, the growing hash rate, the growing number of miners, the growing number of transactions, the network effect, strength in numbers. Each new person added into the Bitcoin economy exponentially increases the value of the network effect of Bitcoin. Imagine where we'll be in another five years. And speaking of numbers, let's play a round of the world's favorite game, Guru Roulette, where I've replaced the numbers on a roulette wheel with the names of Bitcoin gurus. I'll spin the wheel and roll the marble, and for the selected guru, give a little background on their Bitcoin philosophy. So here we go. And the winner this time on Mad Men Machine Season 2, Episode 11 is... George Gilder. George F. Gilder, born November 29th, 1939, makes him 74 years old, is an American investor, writer, economist, techno-utopian advocate, and author of the 1981 international bestseller, Wealth and Poverty. I remember George from the uh, late 80s, early 90s, when he had a Forbes ASAP column, where he was a very enthusiastic evangelist of technology and the internet through several books and his newsletter. Well, recently, Nick Gillespie of Reason TV interviewed him about his stance on Bitcoin. Let's have a listen. George Gilder is the author most recently of Knowledge and Power. He is lately passionate about Bitcoin, so we're going to find out what's turning him on about this cryptocurrency. George, thanks for talking to us. Great to be here. Uh, you know, you have a, a history of being ahead of the curve. You helped start the Reagan Revolution and the Supply Side Revolution with books like Wealth and Poverty. Uh, you were way ahead of the curve on the telecomputer, you know, which turned into the Internet, uh, about how when things get really small and, uh, you know, they get more and more powerful in the telecosm. Now you are absolutely passionate about Bitcoin. What was your aha moment that you, okay, Bitcoin is, is the, the deal of the future? Well, I just written Knowledge and Power uh, about information theory. Right. And I figured that uh, Shannon's information theory cause was perfect instrument for creating a network that mm -hmm. could efficiently transmit, transmit bits and bytes. Right. However, to have a civilization, you need more than just bits and bytes. You need contracts, you need transactions, you need provable facts, you need titles, you need notarizations, you need identities, you need all these other factors that really can't be accommodated very well on the internet. So you have to have banks and all these other outside channels to conduct transactions. You have this comedy of bogus uh, mm -hmm. contracts uh, as we were supposed to sign as you proceed. Right. Uh, yeah, you and click the button, you accept uh, with, with yeah, company yeah, rates. Yeah. Who the I hell mean, the, yeah. the internet is full of junk. Right, right. And and it pretends that a lot of its stuff is free, which right. of course is a lie, so yeah. it's full of lies. It's a hustle. Okay. It's a lot of the characteristics of the internet are uh, the result of just having a pure uh, Shannon information uh, without that. higher... Uh, Shannon information. Shannon, inf Shannon identifies information exclusively by its surprisal, okay. unexpected bits. Yeah, well, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a breakthrough in information theory that allows without reference to trusted third parties, mm -hmm. people outside the internet, to conduct 
provable transactions, mm -hmm. time-stamped transactions that can't be changed. And it's also a better, better currency. It has a wonderful insight that the world is deflationary under capitalism. Okay. That mm -hmm. Bitcoin as a currency on the internet, peer-to-peer, -peer, managed by the participants mm -hmm. in it, is uh, the perfect is... libertarian solution and to the money you... enigma. Yeah, George Gilder, just like anybody who tries to predict the future, he's right on some things, he's wrong on others. I remember when he recommended that we all go out and buy stock in Global Crossing, and it was so compelling, so convincing, that I did. I think I put several thousand dollars into that stock, and in the end it ended up worth zero. Thanks a lot, George Gilder. You're the guru on Mad Men Machine Season 2, Episode 11. Well, I'm hoping you don't have to learn that lesson the hard way by putting your faith in people's predictions about the future, especially when it comes to your investments. No, there's a better way to invest, and that's according to your risk capacity. Let's listen to the next step in the 12-step programs for active investors. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight... 9, 10, 11, 12. A 12 step program for active investors. Step 10 Risk Capacity. My name is Paul, and I'm an active investor. We're getting there. It took me some time to figure out just how much risk to take with my investments. I've had to stop lying to myself, so I took my time on the Risk Capacity survey and got it right. I don't like to fight with active investments. I have finally come home. I'm trying to break out of this. I'm not sick anymore. Taking up all my time studying investments ain't working. I'll wake up and move on. I realize that I need to add some risk exposure to my portfolio. I'm tired of taking no chances. I'm gonna make it happen now. I've been wasting a lot of time patching together an active portfolio. I'm tired of mending these fences. I'm gonna make it happen now. Break off your lies Take your time, get it right, you're not alone You don't like to fight Lord, you wise, do it right, come on home I'm trying to break out of this I'm not sick anymore Taking my time ain't Investors are entitled to a level of return that matches their risk capacity. There are five dimensions for determining risk capacity. First, your time horizon and liquidity needs. Second, your attitude towards risk. Third, your net worth. Fourth, your income and savings rate. And finally, your investment knowledge. Your risk capacity can be determined by answering the questions in the Risk Capacity Survey at IFA.com. If you've never asked yourself these questions, if you've never taken the Risk Capacity Survey, we're here to rescue you. We're here to bring you home. Is there some way you can rescue me? Some way you can bring me home again? Some way you can rescue me? Rescue You're listening to Cool Boyer's Mad Money. Machine. Are you getting engaged in the Let's Talk Bitcoin coin, LTB coin, the token for the Let's Talk Bitcoin network? I think what they're doing out there is shockingly successful. <laughs> I have to say it. Uh, Adam has got something really great going with this LTB coin. Releasing the tokens out into the wild and letting people uh, spend and accumulate them. 
Uh, I finally spent some of my LTB coin. If you didn't notice, I bought an advertisement on the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast a few shows ago. But notice all of the articles that are being written on the Let's Talk Bitcoin uh, dot com website. These people are writing articles to collect up LTB coin, and it's working. People are commenting on articles. Some of them simply say, nice, <laughs> but others have well thought out comments that add to the discussion. I got one person commenting finally on the uh, simulation argument that I've been mentioning in the past. Been waiting for that to happen. And of course, there's the magic words that kind of prove that you've uh, kind of prove that you've been listening to an episode. Mad Men Machine makes it more difficult than the other podcasts because I want you to be rewarded. Those of you who really listen to the show, I want you to get a bigger share of the LTB coin that's parceled out for this episode. And so for this episode, the magic word can be found during the sponsor segment. You have to go, remember the sponsor segment that I had earlier? What was the account name of the person that I used in the, as an example in the sponsor segment, it's 12 letters, no spaces. I spelled it out for you. I spelled all the letters out. You might have to go back and listen uh, to that account name that I used during the sponsor segment. Go to letstalkbitcoin.com. At the top of the page, you'll see LTB coin rewards. Hover over that, scroll down to magic words. Of course, you'll need an account at letstalkbitcoin.com for this all to work. But when that page comes up, enter that magic word and click verify, and you'll be good to go. Now, you've got four days to do it. So we're trying to get people to listen to the shows as they come out. I think that's going to be sometime late Tuesday is the, is the deadline. Get your LTB coins, accumulate them, spend them, buy a sponsorship slot on the Mad Money Machine. I actually held an auction out there for a... Uh, sponsorship slot on the mad money machine uh, someone won it i think it was 105 lt 105,000 ltb coin or something uh, i haven't heard anything from anybody email me bitcoin at madmoneymachine.com if you want to use your sponsor token uh, i don't know what's going on but uh, you know you can use that sponsor token on the uh, ltb uh, the let's talk bitcoin podcast itself too so maybe that's what they did they bought the sponsor token from me and used it on Let's Talk Bitcoin instead, but that's okay. I got a CryptoKit secure email from James saying that he'd be willing to accept some Bit uh, LTB coin from me in exchange for revamping my website. And that sounds like a pretty cool idea. The problem was James didn't include his public key in his CryptoKit message for me to reply to him. And the way CryptoKit works, there's no reply email address in there so I get the message I can't reply to it other than mentioning James on my show so uh, send me your public key and I'll reply to you here's another article this one from um, cryptocoinnews.com Josiah Wilmoth the USD coin may become reality says crypto Lina Bitcoin regulation panel and the hits just keep on coming for two-time guru, Edmund Moy, former U.S. Mint director. He believes a future USD coin is likely due to the immense cost associated with manufacturing and distributing fiat currencies. Even though they have, may not have said so publicly, Moy believes the U.S. government agencies are currently debating ways to co-opt cryptocurrency features that could decrease the cost of U.S. dollar management. He cited the U.S. penny, which carries manufacturing costs amounting to three times its value. Taxpayers subsidize the extra two cents required to mint a penny. And Moy believes widespread adoption of digital currency could make this expense unnecessary. Do you remember the um, April Fool's episode of Mad Money Machine where I, uh, I de uh, told you about how, J how Janet Yellen has decided uh, that they're going to implement USD coin. It was an April Fool's joke. Well, look who's the fool now. Here stands the fool, in the words of the Fix song. <laughs> Keep going back to the Fix. 
The article continues saying, despite government interest in adopting digital currency features, the process will be far from simple. Mr. Moy noted governments are accustomed to possessing the ability to arbitrarily and instantaneously inflate their national currencies. Governments bristle at the thought of limited coin supplies or even fixed rates of inflation, so it's unlikely they will be willing to submit themselves to the limitations imposed by cryptocurrency's algorithmic nature. Yeah, I, um, I, I think you can create a cryptocurrency that's inflationary. LTB coin um, has, I think, doesn't it have an arbitrary cap of 510 million, whatever the number is? Bitcoin itself, if consensus was reached, could go beyond the 21 million. Now you have to convince everybody, or I guess at least 51% of the people, that, yeah, we're going to change the rules. We're going to change the software in Bitcoin, go beyond the 21 million. If the government controlled the keys to a cryptocurrency, do you think they'd limit themselves to some X millions of USD coins? <laughs> oh my goodness. But at least it might be a little bit more transparent. I mean, built into software, we could see the actual number of USD coins that existed. And the article ends up saying that uh, the United States is not the first government to pursue its own digital currency. Recently, Ecuador announced a decision to ban Bitcoin and instead offer its citizens a government-sponsored cryptocurrency. Well, we'll see how this all plays out. Fun times. I posted a question out on Twitter saying, what should I talk about this week on the Mad Money Machine? Uh, one person said, talk about PandaCoin. Well, I had never actually paid any attention to PandaCoin before, so I Googled it and went onto the Reddit for PandaCoin, P-N-D. And up comes an article saying, Leaked PandaCoin documents set the bar high for alternative currencies. Taylor Tyler, August 18th. He says, It's come to the point where it seems there's a new altcoin created every day, and many of them are simply copies of copies released by people hoping to capitalize on the innovation of others. So when new information comes out about an altcoin actually offering something new to the table, it's quite exciting. And the proof-of-stake coin is called PandaCoin, P-N-D, and it has been operational since February 16th. The developers have claimed for some time now that they plan to release major announcements on August 30th. Announcements that will, quote, change the way that the world views cryptocurrencies, unquote. Sounds like a quite a grand claim to make. But two days ago, someone beat the developers to the punch and the highly sensitive PandaCoin information was leaked in the form of what appears to be a website template titled Test Homepage 2, which provides specific and thorough details regarding the revamping of the coin. And they say that the template says PandaCoin is positioned to reach mainstream users from multiple market segments and cultures, in particularly China and Southeast Asia, by removing high barriers of entry to the fast-paced and complex world of cryptocurrencies. Unquote. The developers will neither confirm nor deny the authenticity of the leak. The clever leak, I might add. And the article says, perhaps the biggest development shown in the leak is that of Panda Bank, the coin's own bank, which will allow users to store their Panda coin and earn 2.5% interest per year. And I'm wondering, where does that interest come from? If we look at fractional reserve banking, it's created out of thin air, just like fiat currencies, just like the guy in Australia's ATM. Well, nonetheless, I'm a sucker for innovation, and I can't wait to see what's going to happen August 30th, just eight short days away, with PandaCoin. Another Twitter uh, listener asked me to talk about Litecoin and the future, and what is the value in merge mining with Doge. If you're a Litecoin fan, you've probably come to the wrong guy. Because I kind of believe in uh, what might be the what might be called the cryptocurrency singularity. I think in the end, there's probably just going to be one big universal currency as the winner. Things tend to merge into one standard, the strength in numbers, the network effect. Of course, just like any prediction about the future. This one stinks just as equally as all the other ones stink. What's the value in merge mining with Doge? Strength in numbers. You get two for the price of one. 
You get to use all that existing Litecoin hardware now for the benefit of Doge. And speaking of Doge, there was an article out at Let's Talk Let's Talk Bitcoin.com about Doge Party, the um, complement to Counterparty. I guess Doge Party is to Dogecoin what Counterparty is to Bitcoin. Only there are several advantages to the way Doge Party and Dogecoin will work. You know, Counterparty is slow. I tried to buy some XCP a while back and takes a long time for things to happen with on the blockchain and counterparty. The great hope is that with Doge Party, things will take, well, be 10 times faster, basically, because of the one minute block times instead of the 10 minute block times in Doge. So sorry, hope I didn't offend Litecoin believers too badly there. The third tweet someone replied to me was asking, uh, could you have a look at how Lossky's proposals would also affect the rest of the world, not just New York City? And I'm hoping that they don't affect the rest of the world. I hope they do just affect New York and New York City. And I hope they affect them very, very poorly. I like the fact that I'm hearing some uh, Bitcoin sites are saying that if these Bitcoin proposals go into effect, they'll just block New York. That's the spirit. So how would that affect the rest of the world? Maybe the rest of the world would wake up and not be so draconian. Nah, that'll never happen. Well, I do want to thank you for listening to and supporting the Mad Money Machine. This is Paul Boyer saying it takes money to make money and it takes Bitcoin to make a Mad Money Machine. I'll see you in two Fridays from now. That's September 5th. 3 p.m. Eastern Time, generally or thereabouts, or somewhat after that. In the meantime, buy some Bitcoin, spend some Bitcoin, donate some Bitcoin, and then replenish your Bitcoin. If there's anything at all you liked about the show, tweet it out, including at Mad Money Machine. Patronize our sponsor, Brocker.com, B R A W K E R.com. Before you buy it, Brocker it. Check out the show notes for links to articles and videos used in this episode of the Mad Money Machine. Stay tuned for the Mad Money Machine After Party, where we talk about stuff not necessarily related to Bitcoin. See you in a couple weeks. If we are living in a simulation, it's a pretty good one, don't you think? The developer, whoever it was, the great old designer, made a very rich immersive experience for us all to live in. And it's not hard to imagine that it is a simulation. If the universe is made up of bits as the smallest unit of uh, physical matter is actually information and computer power doubles every 18 months, then in a million years, computers will be able to simulate physical reality. And perhaps they started a million years ago. What do you think about it all? Don't you think the great old designer could uh, make a physical reality with, you know, laws of physics that are generally adhered to, but if he wanted to, could from time to time interrupt <laughs> the laws of physical reality with changes in the simulation, so to speak. The designer wanted there to be certain rules in the simulation, wanted the people in the simulation to realize that there was a designer, and really wanted the simulation to turn out to be good instead of evil. And maybe the great old designer even invented Bitcoin.
Yes, that was Bob Dylan with When You Gonna Wake Up from his 1980 album, Slow Train Coming. Some of the things he mentions in that song are, I think, more relevant today than they were back in 1980 even. Could Bob Dylan predict the future? Or maybe he realizes that we're all just living in a simulation. Something I suppose that we will eventually wake up from. Thank you so much for listening. Find the show notes for this show not only out on madmanmachine.com, but on letstalkbitcoin.com, which is the place you can comment on them, and I suppose earn some LTB coin for commenting. Let me know what you think about the simulation.